What's good, y'all? It's your boy Ross back at again with another video. So I'm gonna check out WWE wrestlers who were forced to lose a match. Now, hey, part of being in the business, there may be uh, situations where you may not want to lose to a certain person, but you gotta be professional and you kind of have to go out there and, and do what the booker wants you to do, you know? So even if you may not like this person, you don't really care for this person, maybe you feel like the outcome should be different. If they, you know, deem it otherwise, you got to be professional for the most part. It don't happen all the time, but you need to be professional. Go out there and do the job that they ask you to do, ask you to do. So we're going to check out some of them instances where wrestlers definitely probably didn't want to, you know, do the job for someone, but they were forced to do it. You know, just, you know, how, however, the booking decision was uh, made to, to go in a particular way. Appreciate all love support. We're going to get right into it, man wrestlers who are forced to job and reluctantly put over their opponent. Be sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell for daily wrestling videos and follow us on Facebook for exclusive layers. Number 10, Ryback. One of the more surprising outcomes oh at WrestleMania 29 <laughs> saw Ryback lose to Mark Henry. Now this made no sense as Ryback was one of WWE's top babyfaces and the very next night would start a main event feud with WWE Champion John Cena. The loss confused everyone and this mm -hmm. extended to Ryback himself who questioned the booking move and ultimately knew it was the incorrect decision to lose. Ryback discussed this during an interview with Sports Illustrated and this is what the former WWE star had to say. I was under the assumption that I was going over Mark Henry at WrestleMania and then turning heel the next night on John Cena Which when I found days before that I was not going over way. but they wanted me to fall on my face with my finish and look like an idiot. I said there was no way I was doing that. I asked why are we doing this? I went to Vince and spoke with him for 30 minutes in Gorilla, the staging area behind the curtain, and he lied to me how this was the reason for my heel turn, that I fell on my face and tripped. I just couldn't <laughs> cut it, and that's why I'd turn heel. Number 9, CM Punk. <laughs> Even though I'm, you know, not the biggest fan of Ryback, that definitely sounds like a Vince McMahon booking. That, ah, uh, that's... And once again, he was one of the most over guys in the company back at that time, so... It doesn't make sense when you really think about it, but, uh, you know, it is what it is. <laughs> it's well documented over the years just how much WWE creative CM Punk disagreed with during his final 12 months in the company. Uh -huh. At the 2013 Royal Rumble, Punk would have his record-breaking title reign yeah. shattered by The Rock, and this was a questionable call. Punk's reign was truly incredible, and despite it being an extended reign, it still felt fresh and current. Punk should have walked into WrestleMania 29 as the reigning champion, but WWE had other ideas. Yep. WWE's grand idea was to have Punk drop the title to The Rock, and then the WWE title would be positioned in between The Rock and yep. John Cena for the WrestleMania rematch. Punk felt like he was being pushed aside for a part-timer, and he was completely right. Punk even suggested the WrestleMania 29 match become a triple threat, as Punk believed he deserved to main event WrestleMania, and this was something that the fans sure. collectively agreed on with Punk. Number 8, Triple H. Yeah, now nah, that's definitely, uh, a lot of people had those sentiments. Uh, you need, and I'm a fan of The Rock, but I knew. I was like, yeah, they're about to end his title reign so he can, Rock can get the championship. And then they have a feud with John Cena and The Rock for another time at WrestleMania. The first time was good. Second time wasn't as good. And we knew who was going to win there. Um, my only thing is, and I think a lot of us agree, if you you can still have that match, but you put cm punk in there you can still have that match but put cm punk in the match do that i think that triple threat would have fucking went crazy because it then you can in a sense you know you'll probably have cm punk lose but he'll be able to have that main event most likely john cena will win it you can call it a day or you can pull the biggest swerve ever and actually have cm punk beat both of these guys obviously by cheating or you know, and doing something but i mean it was just one of those things I, I get what they were trying to do they were trying to replicate what happened the previous year with john cena and the rock but it wasn't going to happen the same way because we already knew how the outcome would be so it's unfortunate and there was notoriously a ton of bad blood between triple h and the rock and it was a tough task to pinpoint where it all started 
Some wrestling historians would argue it started way back in 1997 when The Rock defeated Triple H to become Intercontinental Champion. Triple H has admitted himself that he took exception to losing this match and on an episode of WWE Rivals, he would go so far as saying he was pissed over the creative direction. Ah. It wouldn't be far-fetched to suggest that this greatly upset The Rock and he saw that the game wasn't someone that was willing to put over a fellow talent. Number seven, mm. Chris Jericho. And their history, you know, their rivalry has, you know, been well documented, but it seems like they're on way better terms. And once again, you know, you're young, you're in the company, you're trying to make a name for yourself, and sometimes you feel like you shouldn't be losing to certain people, you know? So I understand it. You know, you're young, you're trying to be the guy. You want to be the guy, and you're working your way up there, so you feel like losing to someone that you don't feel like you should be losing to on paper can be frustrating and now the person can be like damn bro you ain't trying to trying to do business with me like it can create some tension but i'm glad i'm willing to bet now it's much better than what it was back then so when chris jericho was given his creative plans for wrestlemania he was so unbelievably livid that he almost quit the company on the spot Jericho I I heard was about booked this. to lose to new star Fandango, yeah. who was debuting his new ballroom persona. Jericho was stunned that WWE, and specifically Vince McMahon, would think so little of him that they would book him to lose to a novelty character on the grandest stage. Mm -hmm. According to Jericho, it was a conversation with The Undertaker that made him reluctantly agree to do the match, but it was clear from watching the match that Jericho's heart really wasn't in it. The inaugural Undisputed Champion reflect on the match in his autobiography, and this is where Jericho revealed that he was initially booked to face Ryback. Although oh. I didn't want to work with him, Jericho recounts, I decided to do what Vince asked and for that, Vince paid me one of the biggest payoffs I've ever received. Oh. Most of the time with Vince, it's not arguments, it's just debates or it's very calm. This is what you're doing. I wasn't supposed to be working with Fandango at WrestleMania 29, it was supposed to be Ryback. And that was kind of the deal we had made. That was a promise that was made and it was changed very quickly for no reason. I wasn't happy about that either. And guess what? You know, Vince knew that. Paid him handsomely and shout out to, you know, uh, The Undertaker. Uh, just being that guy still, a uh, locker room leader, even, you know, you know, maybe not being in the locker room at that precise moment, but being the guy that people respect so much that they'll listen to his opinion, even if they don't understand Vince's standpoint. Like, hey, you know, that's, that's crazy. That's the testament to how many people respected The Undertaker. Number six, Hulk Hogan. Unfortunately, the legendary Hulk Hogan had made a career of failing to put over talent when the oh, time man. came. At WrestleMania 18, Hogan was going to pass the torch to The Rock, but on the day of the pay-per-view, to nobody's surprise, Hogan suddenly had an issue with doing business. Of course. According to former head writer for WWE, Brian Gowitz, just hours before the show, Hogan began to question the booking and even stated that he wasn't even sure he was going through with putting the great one over. Thankfully, this was a different time in WWE and Hogan didn't have as much political power as he previously uh -huh. did. Vince McMahon would have no doubt insisted that Hogan do the job and put over The Rock. Number five, Shawn mm -hmm. Michaels losing to Stone Cold. In the late 1990s, heard about Shawn this Michaels one too. was without a doubt the most problematic wrestler on the WWE roster. HBK was WWE's number one guy, yet he had a ton of baggage as a human being that made him extremely unpleasant to mm -hmm. be around. WrestleMania 14 was set to be HBK's final match in the company as his back injury was going to force him to retire. WWE wanted Michaels to drop the title to Austin before sailing off into the sunset. The problem was that there was a major concern that HBK wasn't going to do the job and was going to bail at the last moment. Mm -hmm. This angst from WWE was so substantial that it was said that The Undertaker was going to physically make HBK go out there and deliver the match. HBK would end up sticking to the original script and he put over Austin in what would end up his final WWE match until 2002. Yeah, because people weren't really sure if he was going to do the job. Because back then, y'all made say CM Punk is a cancer, which I don't really feel like he is. He definitely probably has, you know, his fair share of moments with people that, you know, rubbing the wrong way or vice versa. But if there was anybody that was a cancer and it was documented from multiple people from back in the day, it was Sean. And obviously people change, you know, he was under a lot of influences outside of just wrestling. You know, if you know, you know. But he was a guy that a lot of people did not like, but they couldn't say much. Well, they could say much, but his position in the company was so high because, one, Vince knew he was a draw. Vince knew that he was really good. And HBK knew he was really good. So when you know all these things, 
You literally can say and damn near do anything for the most part without repercussions other than people actually beating the shit out of you. So, and it was, just, once again, different time back then. So, but I have definitely heard that that uh, particular story. Undertaker say, hey, do the job for him or we gonna have some fucking problems. <laughs> Two, number four, Neville. And Neville deserves all the credit in the world for his 2017 character reinvention. Neville turned heel at the start mm -hmm. of the year and his new villainous persona will be propelled into the struggling cruiserweight division. Neville's run in the division was outstanding as his body work was amongst the finest of his entire career. But it all came crashing down when oh, Vince McMahon yeah, wanted Enzo Amore this. to dethrone him. The problem here was that Amore wasn't exactly Shawn Michaels in the ring and Enzo carrying the division would dramatically regress the status of the division itself. Yeah. Neville knew that this was a baffling move and after he reluctantly agreed to put over Amore at the 2017 No Mercy event, McMahon wanted him to job to Amore yet again but yeah. this time Neville said no thank you and left the WWE forever. Speaking to Wrestling Inc. in 2018, he discussed leaving the company and his reasoning was completely valid. Of it course. wasn't really Enzo why I left. I don't hate the lad, he was just annoying backstage and putting the title on him was bad, especially beating me. I was worth more than being jobbed out to jobbers. That's why I left. Number And who can blame him? And it's crazy, a lot of people have said Enzo was so fucking annoying and people didn't like Enzo. Like, it's it's funny how many people have said that. If, if you want to say that's another cancer, Enzo may have been one of those individuals. Granted, we don't per se know, but, you know, there have been reports and people saying they just didn't like him. They just didn't like his character, his attitude, or whatever the case may be. But I can understand why Neville's like, yeah, I'm out of here, bro. What are we doing? We're supposed to be building up this vision. Putting the Cruiserweight on Enzo did nothing <laughs> for the division at all. But three, Sasha Banks. When WWE crowned Remember Sasha Banks too. and Bayley as the first ever WWE Women's Tag Team Champions, it made sense for the two to have a lengthy reign with the titles. The duo were two of the most popular stars in the women's division, and simply by holding the new titles, there would be buzz and credibility surrounding them. Unfortunately, their run was short-lived, yep. as WWE booked them to lose in a multi-women tag match to the Iconics at WrestleMania 35. Yep. This was a baffling decision and one that still continues to bewilder fans. Uh -huh. According to Meltzer at the time, Banks was furious that she was dropping the title so soon and it was reported that she was under the impression that the duo would be given a decent run to establish the titles and give them credibility. Banks mm -hmm. was so angry following this booking call that she took a leave of absence from WWE programming. Mm -hmm. Number two, Shawn Michaels losing the Hulk Hogan. Oh, the original plans for the know about this Michaels too. and Hogan in 2005 was for the two legends to exchange victories. This would make both men look good and would rule out either man feeling like WWE was screwing them over. Yeah. Their first match was to be at SummerSlam and the creative pitch that both men liked was HBK winning match 1, Hogan winning match 2 and ultimately Hogan winning the final match of the series. When Hogan Which would have been fine. I don't think anybody would have tripped. That would have been cool. A three match series, HBK win the first one, Hogan win the second one, Hogan win the third one. That would have been perfect, but as you may hear, if you don't know, you'll see how things played out. We're talking about Hulk Hogan, brother. Hogan cancelled any plans to do more than one match. Hogan was put over in the SummerSlam match mainly because he was a babyface at the time and WWE had rushed into a heel turn for HBK ahead uh -huh. of the feud. HBK was livid with Hogan and he went out of his way to oversell every yep. single thing Hogan did in the match. He sold a basic <laughs> punch like he'd been Pitbull in F5 and it was one of the most entertaining yet completely yep. well matches in WWE history. And number one, Stone Cold Steve Austin. A SummerSlam 1999 was designed to be Triple H's crowning night. WWE wanted the game to defeat Stone Cold Steve Austin to become WWE Champion and become the top heel in the entire company. Unfortunately, Austin, who was the biggest wrestling star on the planet at the time, had other ideas. Mm. According to Bruce Pritchard on his Something to Wrestle podcast, Austin, just like others in WWE, believed that Triple H just wasn't ready. I don't think that Steve and a lot of the agents at the time felt that Hunter was ready for the championship yet. That wasn't a Steve call, that was a Vince call, and that oh. was a lot of agents. When they heard that, they felt that he'll be ready someday, he's just not ready right now, not with Steve. The SummerSlam main event Damn. would become a convoluted mess as Mankind would be added to the match and Mankind would actually end up winning the featured main event. Despite supposedly not being ready to win the title, the game would win his first WWE title just 24 hours later on Raw, uh -huh. giving extra merit to the claim that Austin refused to put him over. Uh, but there you have it, folks. WWE that's very interesting. I don't think I uh, heard about that, that particular uh, booking decision. That's crazy. I mean, Stone Cold was ridiculously over at that time. Like it, I mean, 
ridiculously over <laughs> it's not even a question of how over he, he really was so um but hey once again things happen egos get involved decisions are made a lot of times the decisions aren't the right decisions and sometimes they happen to be the right decision and it all works out in the end man so it's just one of those things where you know you kind of it's part of the wrestling business it's not you know probably loved by a lot of people where they feel like they shouldn't be losing to certain people uh but you sometimes have to weather the storm to get to that moment and i think a lot of these wrestlers weathered the storm dealt with the bullshit booking or losing to people they shouldn't be losing to and uh some of them were able to overcome that and become bigger stars in the process so comment down below let me know some other wrestling videos y'all want me to check out appreciate all the love support y'all showing on the channel road to 150k appreciate y'all kicking with me see you next one peace